This video is going to be going through uh, chapter three of the HSC Engineering Studies preliminary course, so the year 11 course, and it focuses on braking systems. Uh, this is going to be the first, first video and it's going to cover the um, history and social impacts of brakes. And to, I'm going to be following along with uh, the Copeland uh, Engineering Studies textbook, textbook, Engineering the Definitive Engineering Studies, the Definitive Guide. Okay, so to start off with, uh, before we get to the contracting brand, band brake, we're going to start with the first brakes were just wooden blocks that you would press against the wheel. And so these were used for thousands of years. Uh, Roman chariots would have used uh, wooden block brakes. Uh, these were relatively worked relatively well when you're traveling at uh, the speed of a, a, a horse or an ox or something like that. But uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't be nearly as effective now. Uh, the main reason why we moved away from block, block brakes is because of the uh, invention of the pneumatic tire. So I did have that written here somewhere. Okay. Um, so pneumatic tire it comes from the Greek and Latin origin of pneumo, which is the word for lungs. And so the idea is that a pneumatic tire is an inflated tire. It's got air in it. Uh, it's like the pneu is the um, is a tire in in French, and pneu is um, pneu is the word for lungs in French now. Okay, so when we had a, a rubber tire filled with air, you can no longer apply a wooden block to the side of the, the side of the wheel. So instead, they developed the contracting bla contracting band brake, and the idea there was that a band. Oh, okay, I'm going to get to that. Okay, um, that you would use the contracting band. Okay, so before I get to that, what is the concept here? Well, there's energy transformation. So I'd mentioned before the Hottest 100 Volume 2 and this song. This song talks about how energy never dies, it just changes form. And so this mouse here is reminding you that uh, heat could just be thought about the kinetic energy or the movement of all the particles in an object. But the way the brakes work is that brakes work by transforming kinetic energy via friction into heat. The first um, person that we can really associate with uh, brake linings, which is something we're interested in, is in this course, is um, Bertha Benz. So, she was married to Carl Benz, the person who developed the Benz Patton motor wagon, uh, one of widely regarded as the first production automobile. There we go. And um, this was in 1885. And Bertha, um, does it say when? Uh, she, yeah, I'm going to go back to this one. Uh, she did the first long distance trip. Uh, so there you go, 5th of August, um, 1888. She did the first long, long distance trip from Mannheim to Flordsheim, which these days can be done in about an hour and six minutes. It took her from uh, uh, dawn to dusk, and she had to make several stops along the way. Uh, she had to fill up with petrol, so she went to a pharmacy or an apothecary in, I'm going to say, Weissloch, and uh, so it's the oldest petrol station in the world. And... Um, let's see what else. She cleaned a, uh, a blocked fuel line with a hairpin used to guard her as insulation. She had to get a blacksmith to repair a chain. Um, she couldn't go up hills, so she made her, her sons that she was taking with her to her mother's house, um, Eugene and Rickard, to help push the, the car up the hill. And as a result, they added an additional gear. Uh, it also, and this is the part we're interested in, is that she added a brake line to, uh, she visited a cobbler and they put a, a layer of leather over the wooden block brake. And that way, when the leather got, well, not only did it improve stopping, but uh, the leather wears away before the wood. It's a lot cheaper to replace a piece of leather or a brake pad, a brake lining, than it is to replace the whole brake. So that's what we're um, we're interested in when we talk about brake linings. Okay, so now we're up to band brakes, and um, our band brakes are still used in some applications, but these days band brakes have mostly been replaced with drum brakes. Uh, we saw at the start of the video an exploded version of a um, 
a drum break, uh, and we are interested in exploded drawings. Um, we generally have to draw an assembled version of these drawings. So we might be given this. This is uh, I don't think it's drawn exactly as in um, isometric, but we will often have to draw a, a section of this, a cross section through this in an orthogonal view. Um, they also have a disc break, which we're going to talk about in a second. Okay, so um, what do we have? Okay, so this is what a drum break looks like. So generally what we can see from the outside is the drum. Uh, but inside the drum we have some parts and if we and here's the labeled parts and exploded 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 diagram and if we add in gif to that yes gif not gif um, what have we got well okay once upon a time it used to look like this so you would have something that it would be mechanical and you would have a um, a lever that would expand those brakes when they expanded out uh, um, when those brakes uh, when these shoes expanded I should have shown you in the, the label diagram but when the shoes expand against the walls of the drum the vehicle slows down so here we can see when someone presses the pedal uh, brake fluid which is incompressible will be uh, will, will uh, be displaced which pushes the brake shoes and here we can see brake shoes pushing against the drum so that's what we've got in a um, drum brake so here we have uh, just a label diagram. So we have the shoes, a brake lining goes on the outside of the shoes. We have a wheel cylinder, which is what fills up with fluid. We have some other things we're interested in like adjusters and, um, and return springs. So if we look at this, uh, this one here, this animation, I'm just waiting for it to load. We can see that the, as the fluid expands, it causes the shoes to pull out. But we also have things like self-adjusters and the self-adjusting system is that as the shoes start to wear down, we uh, the self-adjuster will adjust and as a result, make sure that the time from you hitting uh, the pedals to the time the vehicle starts stopping is um, consistent. Okay, so after that, we'll then go to the next one, which is disc brakes. So once upon a time, uh, we used to use disc brakes on the front wheels only because most of the stopping happens on the disc brakes, uh, on the front brakes. And because disc brakes are more effective, uh, we wanted the um, stopping to be with the better brakes, so we used disc brakes. Drum brakes still being used on the back. Heavy vehicles like trains or 40-ton um, trucks, they might still use drum brakes, uh, but... Even in that case, they're, they're slowly being replaced with disc brakes as they get more and more, as they get cheaper and cheaper. Okay, so the main event. Oh, okay. So before I move on, why did we replace? Um, why did we go from band brakes into drum brakes? Well, in 1902, Louis Renault. The, there's a company called Renault. They also developed, I think, the airbag. They uh, chose this option because. Um, because it's because it's contained it's not as affected by the weather so it also doesn't pick up debris like uh, rocks or um, leaves which could have um, which reduced the effectiveness of the contracting band break so the drum break was um, more reliable it lasted longer it was um, less affected by adverse conditions there's uh, some details if you read the book about things like leading shoes and how that produces servo sifts assist but um, for the moment I am going to focus on just a, a higher level because this is the second time I've recorded this video um, okay so we're now on to disc brakes and disc brakes were adopted originally the first disc brake in my notes here uh, the first disc brake was actually produced in 1902 but um, band brakes weren't produced until 10 years after the first uh, in, after the Benz Patton motor wagon or um, several years after Bertha's ride. Um, disc brakes were first developed in 1902, but they weren't successful, so they, they weren't used. And they, were, um, they weren't pat patented and used on, they were originally used on motorcycles in 1921. Okay, so what are we gonna have a look here? Well, first of all, we'll look at, and you can actually see um, on most cars, you can see the disc brakes. Uh, in this case, it's very clear because it's a very exposed uh, rim and it's a very brightly colored disc brake. But even on just a standard Toyota, you can still see the disc brake in the background there. So it's concealed, but you can still see it. Okay, so this is the exploded disc brake, uh, which we looked at earlier. We're not going to go into too much detail, but the concepts we're gonna look into is we're gonna know what um, a caliper is. So if we talk about vernier calipers, 
A vernier caliper is a tool that measures the distances by squeezing the thing. And that is the concept of how disc brakes work. Kind of like uh, when you ride a push bike, you have uh, the brakes clamp on the side of the wheels. Well, in this case, we don't clamp on the side of the wheels, but we clamp to a disc that is attached to the side of the wheel. Now, the advantage of the disc brake, aside from having better stopping distances, is that they're uh, better able to dissipate heat and uh, thus convert more kinetic energy into heat at a faster rate. Uh, how it does this is by having venting in the side and the venting in the side allows air and sometimes it can have so it can be that venting along the edge and also those holes that have been drilled in they all allow hot air to escape the uh, the disc faster so how do they work well they work by clamping and I guess we'll start with this one. So when we push the pedal, uh, it displaces fluid. The fluid causes the calipers to clamp on the disc, also known as the rotor, and the brake pads on the disc will then um, will then clamp down. So here we just see, I'm just gonna show a few different, um, so we have friction co causes the kinetic energy to transform into um, heat. Uh, this is important. So these are friction brakes, I should point out. Um, that when you write your engineering report, it's really important that you have that definition. That if I ask how do brakes work, that you say that brakes friction brakes work by converting kinetic energy to heat via friction. And we can see that what we have is the brake fluid. So this is um, really talked to. We showed that picture of a drum brakes which run on um, that run on. A mechanical process these work on a hydraulic process so we use um, brake fluid and brake fluid is good because it doesn't compress so it means that the tr force is going to be transferred uh, quickly it also gives us mechanical advantage which we'll learn about uh, later in this course when we do Pascal's principle uh, I think we've covered most of these I think we've looked at most of the, these uh, these gifts at this point um, I, I must say I didn't really notice that you can see that it's actually squeezing here um, and similar concept here. So generally, when you have to draw your um, set your your diagram for your engineering report, I would suggest that for your disc brakes, you should show this view, not that view, because this view provides a lot more information. Okay, so I think that we've covered enough to uh, talk about disc brakes for the moment. Okay, what do we have to? We just talked about calipers. Uh, we don't need the song. Okay, when you draw those diagrams, uh, it's important that you show some non-essential non features for maximum marks. So I have things like return springs, uh, if you describe servo assist, if you uh, describe how the hydraulic brake fluid works. Uh, but things that are essential, you must show the brake shoe, you must show the drum wall, that's, that's an essential. Uh, I'm not expecting it to be perfect, it has to be a freehand sketch, but things that will lose marks is if it's drastically not to scale, so in that case that doesn't look circular at all, or if the curves are very wonky, that's, a, that's um, something that I might look for. Each of your diagrams should be about half a page, as in you should be able to fit both of them onto the one page of your engineering report. Okay, so we're moving on in the textbook now, and we're now on to ABS brakes or anti-locking braking systems. The idea is that um, rally car drivers found that you lost control of the steering while you were braking. You either had, um, you could choose either steering or braking, and that also, when you, if you're even on a straight, if you just press the brakes, you would get brake fade. So what um, rally car drivers would do is they would tap the brakes and eventually that led to a computerized system so that the brakes don't lock up and this uh, provides a shorter stopping distance. It means that fewer people are injured in car accidents. Uh, a way that you can think of this, and obviously this is a metaphor, but we have this, these two dogs and they're trying to not go into the water, they're trying to break. This, the dog on the right has just planted his heels in and the dog on the left has done lots of little breaks. So that, that kind of gives you something of an idea of um, the concept of how ABS brakes work. Now, the advantage of this is obviously it's better stopping distance, but not in all cases. Um, so sometimes we actually need the wheels to lock up. If you're driving on gravel, it can be um, ABS brakes. You may have to turn off your ABS brakes. I have had the experience of, um, I was once, 
uh, when I was working for a rural council on Friday afternoon, I had to drive one of the engineers home or dr- drive him to the airport in Canberra. On the way back, I had taken the wrong turn. I'd sort of dr- driven on autopilot and I now realized I was half an hour further away than I should have been. I took a um, back road to try and get back to where I wanted to be. I was driving on a gravel road and I um, tried to brake around a corner and then started fishtailing, going back and forth and back and forth. And luckily I remembered playing Imperial Assault, uh, the um, uh, sorry, Rebel Assault, where I, if I'm fly, where you fly a TIE fighter and um, where the, the, it was very, um, the, the TIE fighters are very sensitive and uh, you had to remember not to overcompensate. So eventually I was able to control the, the, uh, the car. Um, okay, the next type of brake that we're going to talk about is exhaust and engine brakes. And the idea here, this is um, a bit confused, but um, or confusing, that heavy brakes uh, can you and trucks, buses, and trains, they can use drum brakes and disc brakes. Often, when they're going down long descents, they might use um, another. They might use the engine to cause the um, cause the car to brake. So, engine braking systems. Now, there are also specialized equipment. So ABS, fishtailing, okay. Um, so uh, heavy vehicles often use air brakes, or, um, or so air brake systems, which um, they also use auxiliary braking devices or secondary retarders. So um, these make a loud noise. And so this is the New South Wales government saying that uh, they understand that they're beneficial, that they improve safety, that they also reduce wear on the on, on trucks, and they understand that trucks are a very important part of um, modern society. But they do expect trucks to have um, mufflers to make sure that it's well maintained and uh, to turn off your engine brakes in um, in populated areas. So they they can use just their regular brakes in addition to their um, their jake brakes so let's see if i do i have that as an option jake brakes um huh okay i'll open that so um big big vehicles so when something weighs 40 tons they probably need um they they need additional braking and so here we can see a sign saying no braking in this case um so it's an engine braking mechanism installed on some diesel engines when it opens the exhaust valve so this is where it gets the name engine braking or exhaust braking um when the right the when activated it all opens the exhaust valves right before the compression stroke releasing compressed gas into the cylinders and slows the vehicle. Okay, so they're called Jake brakes uh, because they were originally patented for um, Jacob's engines, but these days it's become a generic trademark. Uh, So what do they sound like? We said that they sound noisy. Well, I've got a video here. Yeah, that'll probably do. Um, okay, so why do they have these brakes? Well, because, uh, okay, so we're going to talk about air brakes. So air brakes, um, we saw before that the systems we looked at before had pneumatic, sorry, they had um, hydraulic brakes. They had brake fluid. But sometimes you might have something happen where you might have uh, no brakes. And so if you have no brakes, what do you do? Well, there's some suggestions. You can shift down into a lower gear. You can um, pull up your uh, on your handbrake, and then as you start to get to lower speeds, you can 
actually drive against the guardrail, which will slow you down. Obviously, you want to do that very, very carefully. It's definitely going to damage your car. And then eventually, you can pull over in, onto the side of the road. But um, so you can try pushing the brakes up and down as well to uh, to activate the brakes. Okay, so um, hazard light to the first step. What, how do these air brakes work? Well, so what they do is they um, either replace or work in um, in combination with a hydraulic system. And what we they have two two uh, methods of activation. And what when the car starts, the exhaust from the engine actually has to force the brake, which is in a locked position, off the excuse me, off the, in, uh, so off a closed position. So the brakes are always applied and then the compressor actually forces the brakes open. With your caution the actuator, all the while the hand control valve is in the off position. When the driver pushes the pedal on the foot control valve, it sends air to the actuator to make an application of the service brakes. And so that's the brakes now being applied. Okay, so um, this very strong um, spring that if there was a leak in the system, if there was a leak in the system, then it would return to it slowly, you would slowly slow down as more and more air leaks, and eventually you would have to repair the leak before you could um, drive away. I heard as a, an anecdote from some firefighters that in um, the bushfires over 2019-2020, uh, a lot of the fire trucks were were lost in the fire because in the heat of the fire the fuel lines melted and as a result the brake uh, the brakes applied and they couldn't drive the vehicle so they they, they just had to leave them there and they, they got destroyed um, okay what are the advantages well air is unlimited um, air couplings are easier to attach and detach um, Air brakes still work even when there's a lot of leakage. Um, they can also be used for other things. Okay, uh, disadvantages. They cost more. Um, they require, like they're larger. They, you often need to have special training. Um, you have to learn how to use them so that they're, they're more difficult to operate smoothly. Um, yeah, that, that'll... Uh, Yeah, okay, so that'll do. Okay, so um, the next type of brakes we're gonna talk about is regenerative brakes. This is the type of braking that's used in hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles. So, and uh, yeah, so the, we'll, st we'll talk about hybrids. So hybrid cars, they run some of the time on petrol and some of the time on electricity. The question is, well, how do they charge electricity? If they don't have a plug, where does that electricity come from? Well, what happens is whenever you want to slow down the vehicle, what you can do is you can use the turn the wheels into mini generators and they will generate electricity that gets stored in a battery. And then when you want to um, go again, you can use the electricity in the battery to help power the, power the wheels. Now, um, in the this video here, and I have another one linked below, uh, this one here as well. They talk about it from a, like a, a racing perspective as well, so that in racing they um, they use these for three main reasons. And um, I, I won't go into the video; you can you can find that. But the three main reasons are that they reduce heat on the brakes, they reduce the wear on the brakes, and they use less energy. And so, if you're trying to um, hold on to your brakes and not have to replace your brakes as often as possible in uh, Formula One, or you want to transfer heat um, faster, and just simply they're they're more efficient, so you don't need to um, pull up to the pits as often. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't follow Formula One, so if anything, any of that's wrong, please let me know. But um, regenerative brakes are most effective in small areas, sorry, not small areas, when you're driving stop-start driving. So if you're driving long distances, they're not going to be very useful because they only really re recharge when, you, uh, when you're braking. So that's, um, you only get most of the advantage when they're braking. So that's why people have hybrids and that's how the hybrid uh, hybrids refuel. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is we talked about regenerative brakes. 
is that um, yeah, automotive handbrake. So automotive handbrakes used to be um, used to be used as part of the drum brake. Uh, they had the advantage of servo assist, but now we have highly effective um, handbrakes using disc brakes. Okay, so the effect on people's lives, the simple, advantage, the simple point is that if you can improve stopping distances or reduce stopping distances, you're going to increase passenger safety and uh, increasing passenger safety is obviously advantage. Uh, it's worth talking about the social component of brakes. So most of the advantages we've seen in the development of brakes have come via racing. And uh, so in the case of disc brakes and some running brake discs and brake pads, they've come via, via racing. And um, so that's a thing that people enjoy. Uh, being able to travel at higher speeds has some other advantages. It allows people to um, to get their goods and services faster, so that increases our quality of life. That if we can travel, if a truck can travel at twice the speed, it means that they're on the road less less often. So that's a secondary benefit of having um, better speeds. There are some negative impacts which we can talk about in terms of environmental considerations. Um, just before I finish talking about safety, so. Uh, there's a podcast, a 99% Invisible podcast called The Nut Behind the Wheel, and I think that's quite good, where it talks about how uh, driving safety used to be kind of considered something like gun safety, and the idea that guns don't kill, kill people, people kill people. Well, people used to say cars don't kill people, bad drivers do. And a lot of the onus was on drivers. But over time, uh, through public pressure, we have changed that mentality so that now car manufacturers are really driving the change to improve the safety of their vehicles. So they really focus on the um, steering column, that the we now have collapsible steering, steering columns, which result in fewer fatalities. But a lot of the developments we've seen, like uh, seat belts and uh, airbags, which initially were, were all these things were resisted by the car manufacturers, have um, have improved the quality of life of motorists and pedestrians. Uh, these days, there is more of a push to be seen as a leader on safety. Okay. Okay, the environmental impacts. Well, so in 1902, um, uh, Herbert Froude was a, a big year for brakes, 1902. Herbert Froude developed asbestos lining. Now, asbestos has been used for a long time. It was used by the Romans. Um, it comes from the Greek word meaning something like indestructible. There we go. And the Romans used to make napkins out of it, and they'd light the napkins on fire when they were finished, or they'd throw them in the fire. Um, I think somewhere that yeah, ancient Egyptians and Charlemagne, there we go, he reportedly used t tablecloth. Uh, made out of asbestos to convince guests that he had supernatural powers. Um, the Romans also were aware that it had some risks. So, um, for, you know, slaves. Uh, but the issue for Australia is we use um, fibro. What is CSR? Is the um, company? Okay, so. We, uh, so I mentioned in the last time I recorded this that I used to work with a guy from England and his wife, she worked in asbestos management and she was amazed at how much more asbestos we had in Australia compared to England. And a big part of that is because asbestos is just a really, uh, England is older, they had older houses pre-existing. Australia built a lot more houses um, during the time that asbestos was popular. And asbestos is... It was a really great material. It has good strength, good fire resistance, and it was readily available or cheap. Um, the thing is now we use uh, fibre cement or compressed fibre cement, cement sheeting, but um, fibro, which we still see around, um, it is a hazardous material because what happens is that very, very tiny fibers get into your lungs, the skin grows over your lungs, and then the skin continues to grow up and grow up and grow up over the top of that, um, that infection, unlike a biological material that would degrade, like timber. So uh, if you breathe in sawdust, it's a lot less likely to cause cancer in your lungs. Whereas um, CSR and James Hardy, they've I believe, both been believed, um, they've been sued successfully, uh, because they were big producers of asbestos sheeting. And 
in 2003 it was initially banned and I think they have a full ban oh there you go okay 2003 it was successfully banned I um in my last time I recorded this I talked about Great Wall I don't Great Wall Trucks and yeah so in um, 2012 they had to uh, recall a lot of trucks uh, these trucks were, were very popular because they were so cheap they were about half the cost of um, a truck a truck by competitors and they had a small amount of asbestos in uh, something an exhaust line something like that um, anyway I will move on so Canada they have been um, criticized for their asbestos policy where they had mines in the province of Quebec they actually had a, a city called asbestos I believe and um, where they, they mined it and it was only banned in 2018 uh, where was where were they selling it to well they weren't selling it to Australia a lot of places they were selling it to were places like India where the argument was well if the quality of life is is lower and people have bigger things to worry about than getting cancer later in life um, who are you to say that they can't use this material? Well, the argument um, that eventually was uh, determined was that this is a, a problem because it's a the asbestos doesn't go away. It's going to be there for generations. So even though you might say right now, this is a price I'm willing to pay, the you're now making a decision for several generations of people who are going to have to re you know, remove this asbestos, which can be very difficult. I Last time I recorded this, I told a story about my brother-in-law um, trying to uh, change it to a small amount of electrical wiring in his place and um, him encountering some asbestos there and uh, how how much stress that, that caused him for a couple of weeks. Okay. So why did we use asbestos? Well, we used asbestos in brakes because it was very tough. It means, means it could absorb a lot of energy and it had excellent thermal properties. Now, um, what did they replace those asbestos fibers with? Well, without going into too many specifics, they replaced those with aramids, which we know as polyamides. And a polyamide, the best examples of polyamides, can you tell me where else do we use polyamides? Starts with an N, New York, London. Nylon is the word I'm looking for. Uh, where else is it used? Starts with a K, Kevlar, Kevlar vests. So polyamide is used in other things because they make very, very strong fibers. Not as good as asbestos, but um, it is used, you can even see in the Wikipedia page, it's used as an asbestos substitute. Okay, the what binds it together? Well, obviously, brake pads, they're a composite material. So, well, when we talk about typical brake pads, they're a composite material. What what holds the those fibers together? Well, often phenyl formaldehyde, which we said was a thermosetting resin. So these were both polymers that we talked about previously when we talked about polymers. And um, there are alternatives. We can use uh, metallic brake pads or ceramic brake pads, which you can see here. And here's a comparison. So ceramic, the most expensive, excellent performance, but uh, they're pretty good for noise. And um, I think that means pretty good for noise. I thought they were really loud, but um, nope, they're very quiet, creating little to no extra sound. Okay. There you go. Um, I was wrong on that one. And excellent wear and tear, but the things they're the most expensive. We can use metallic brake pads. They're a little bit more expensive. Excellent performance, but they're louder and um, put more wear and tear on the brake system than if we use the uh, polymer uh, polymer brake pads. Uh, that said, we might still have additives like copper might be weaved into the um, brake pad to help with um, thermal uh, dissipating the, the heat from from the braking system okay so that's the end of part one let me just check before we move on yep okay so that's the end of part one and then we're going to talk about engineering mechanics starting with friction so i'm going to close that and